Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. I'm Sarah Barrow. I am the, um, the publisher of the journal record. Um, I also wear a couple of other hats, and that's what I was almost about to say. I'm the advertising director. I'm also the events manager and the associate publisher. So um, welcome to today's journal record business roundtable. Um, over the next nine months, 308,000 Oklahomans are expected to lose medical insurance coverage due to the reduction of the Medicaid um, provided by Public Health Emergency Act, which is set to end on May 11th. Thank you to, to, to today's sponsors, Health Alliance for the Uninsured and Oklahoma Primary Care Association for bringing this critical issue to our attention and for sponsoring today's panel discussion. Founded in 1993, Oklahoma Primary Care Association works on behalf of medically underserved patients and communities. They are the state's trade association for community health centers. Oklahoma Primary Care Association offers training and technical assistance to their members, collaborates statewide with healthcare stakeholders, and advocates for patients and safety net providers helping low-income, uninsured, and underinsured clients navigate complex healthcare referral networks, Health Alliance for the Uninsured is a central hub of the referral network, which includes OKC Heartline 211, Be a Neighbor, Unite Us, local hospital systems, and their clinic network. The Health Alliance for the Uninsured team strategically coordinates hundreds of specialists who provide free diagnostic testing, specialty consults, and surgical care for clients of their partner safety net clinics in Oklahoma. Speaking of partners, thank you to Crossings Community Center for hosting today's event. This is a great facility, and I invite you all to stay after the panel discussion and take a tour of the clinic and the whole building. So. Um, the journal record will be posting the video on our website in a few weeks, and we will also be publishing a tab insert that is going to be uh, the transcribed words from today's discussion. So be sure and look for that in a few weeks. Um, again, we want to thank our sponsors, Oklahoma Primary Care Association and Health Alliance for the Uninsured. Without them, programs like today's are not possible. Now let me introduce the panelists so we can get this show on the road. Um, we have with us today Trailer Rains, Medicaid Director with Oklahoma Healthcare Authority, Michael Figgins, CEO, Legal Aid Services of Oklahoma, um, Patty Davis, CEO, Oklahoma Hospital Association, Sarah Berry, CEO, Oklahoma Primary, Primary Care Association, I said that, sorry, and Janine, Jones, Executive Director, Health Alliance for the, uh, for the Uninsured. Um, our moderator, moderator today is Angela Munson, Outreach and Legislative Director for the Oklahoma Policy Institute. So I'm going to turn it over to Angela, and I think we're going to have uh, Michael and Trailer say a few words. But We are, and thank you so very much. Let me say to all of you, thank you for your presence here today. This is a really important topic. I imagine your presence signifies that you know a little something about this issue. And by the time these uh, very distinguished panelists finish, you'll know a whole lot more, uh, particularly about why this is an important discussion for us to have and to have in the business community. Uh, I think all of us know that when COVID-19 kind of took over our lives, uh, things really changed. And, uh, they didn't change for the better for a whole lot of folk. And uh, the health care of a whole lot of individuals that was probably already compromised to some extent uh, became even more fragile. Uh, fortunately, the federal government kind of stepped in and we had this public health emergency that allowed states like Oklahoma and states across the country to take advantage of some expansion, some additional dollars that would support what I consider one of our best public policies ever created. Uh, when I was about 10 years old, you can 
update me with that, uh, the Medicaid program. Uh, and we were able to ensure a whole lot of individuals who otherwise would have gone without health coverage during a long period of time. And that public health emergency has continued over and continued and been extended and extended, and now for real is coming to an end. Uh, and that disruption in the lives of many Oklahomans is probably as critical, as, as serious as COVID-19 when it started. So we are very pleased to have these individuals here present today all of whom have uh, a responsibility, and I know for some in particular, uh, even a, a moral obligation, a uh, obligation to do something to ensure that as many Oklahomans as possible, um, and I'd like to say no Oklahomans, lose coverage uh, through the Medicaid program uh, unnecessarily and certainly because they didn't know what to do, certainly because they didn't know where to go. So we have a responsibility to ensure that that happens. So we're gonna start with these guests. I, I, I could probably introduce a little, uh, tell you a little more about each of them, but I don't have notes. So I'd probably, for some of you, just tell your secrets. Uh, and I'm not gonna do that today, I'll do it afterwards. Uh, so panelists, as you speak, uh, if you'd like to provide any additional introductory information, feel free to do so. I'm an old senator, um, so you give our old politician a microphone, sometimes you know we don't know when to stop, but I'm gonna stop. Uh, suffice it to say, I uh, cut my teeth, my policy teeth in the healthcare field and back in 1978. So this is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. It's so important to ensure that all individuals have access to high quality, medically necessary healthcare services. And I hope you believe the same as we do. And I hope before we leave today that your commitment to ensuring that uh, as a public health emergency winds down in Oklahoma, that we protect the lives of those who are most vulnerable. So with that, Mr. Trailer Range, you get to go first. And we'll, Michael and Patty and Sarah and Janine, we'll just keep going down the list. Thank you. And, and just so you'll know, uh, each of these panelists will have about, what did they tell you? Five minutes? Eight minutes? The first two have longer. The first two have longer. Well. I don't know why they're so special, but uh, no. Uh, take the time that you were told is allotted to you. Once they all finish, uh, we'll open the floor for questions. So we'll have an opportunity for some dialogue and discussion at the end of the panel pr presentations. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks for having me uh, and the rest of the panelists, of course. I could not have said it better, and I could not agree with you more in terms of our moral and really ethical obligation to our members as we start unwinding the Medicaid, um, the public health emergency protected group uh, over the next nine months. So just as a refresher, uh, March 2020, when the public health emergency was announced, uh, the, all the states were given opportunity to receive enhanced federal funding. Um, but along with that came uh, requirements and obligations of those states. One of those requirements was that we not unenroll anyone from the Medicaid, and of course in Oklahoma that's known as Sooner Care. So we could not unenroll anyone from Sooner Care during the public health emergency, uh, unless that person passed away, chose to be unenrolled or moved out of the state, and were then kind of on another state's Medicaid program. So we immediately put all of our protections in place to make sure that wasn't happening. Uh, so we share eligibility determination obligations with a sister agency, uh, Department of Human Services. Uh, so we worked together to make sure that we were continuing to bring people on, do all those eligibility processes, but not kick anyone off the program. So to give you an idea of what we kind of churn on a steady state monthly basis, um, outside of an emergency situation, we have about 25,000 individuals a month come on and off the program. So we have a pretty substantial what we refer to as churn rate. Uh, so if you think about that over the period of three years, we've amassed now around 300,000 individuals who no longer meet eligibility criteria for Medicaid. So you remember you have to be, you have to meet a category. So you have to be a child, pregnant woman, age blind, disabled, and meet certain income thresholds. Um, thankful to uh, expansion and the vote of the people and a lot of hard work from people on this panel to get it passed. Uh, we have Medicaid expansion, so that's a lot more people now. Uh, I wanted to clear up some kind of confusion. As you can imagine, when we kind of get this information into the atmosphere and the universe, it gets confusing. 
Um, it's also not great that our expansion number is eerily close to our public health emergency unwinding number. So we've had a lot of folks say, why are you getting rid of expansion? We're not. Uh, that is still alive and well and will continue to be as long as it's in our constitution. It just happens to be very similar numbers. So we're working with, uh, like I said, around 300,000 individuals. Um, our federal partners have given kind of some broad guidelines for us to work within as we work with our unwinding, but we knew right away, thanks to uh, good leadership of the healthcare authority and others involved, that we wanted to take a very compassionate and intentional approach to how we unwind um, this, the population and do these unenrollments. So thankful to our uh, technology, uh, Oklahoma is actually, I don't think this is said enough, we're actually still the only state in the nation that has a real-time eligibility system uh, such that we can process applications in under 24 hours, and really it's instant when you go through and put your information in. Uh, we're the only state in the nation that does that. But because of that, we have very sophisticated data matching capabilities with IRS, OESC, and other data sources that help us to keep track of our members on a real-time basis or quarterly basis, really, when we get those updates. So throughout this process, although we suppressed our unenrollments, we did not suppress our renewal process. And so we kept pinging all those data sources. So we know at any given time who on our membership has exceeded um, their income thresholds but due to, uh, because of the information we know from IRS and OESC, for example. So throughout that process, we've known, uh, okay, we see the number rise, we know what we're gonna work with, and of course, we didn't know when it was gonna end, and so we kept thinking, okay, we're gonna be prepared when we get that you know, three months notice that it's gonna end. So we uh, immediately set running this population through various um, systems and queries to see who are these folks? Have they even used the Sooner Care program since they've been on? Um, what are their needs? Do they have chronic conditions? What are their diagnoses? Are they receiving a lot of services through pharmacy, for example, that they're reliant on Sooner Care for? So we were able to, through this process, really create a needs-based system on how we are targeting our nine-month enrollment. Uh, we chose nine months because we feel that's a realistic time frame to work within. CMS is giving uh, states a year. But again, because we're not a paper-based system for the most part, we're not a county-based system, we have the technology infrastructure to do it quicker, uh, while still paying attention to the needs of our members, uh, we chose nine months, because you have to remember too, there is a cost associated to the state for carrying members who are technically no longer eligible for Medicaid. Um, so, and also knowing that that enhanced federal dollar matching is going down. So part of the Consolidated Appropriations Act from the feds in December said that, okay, states, we're gonna give you FMAP through the end of the unwinding period, but it's gonna taper. It's gonna go from 6.2% down to, I think, 1.5% in that last quarter. So we have to be very cognizant of how you know, we're stewards of uh, your taxpayer dollars. So uh, what we did was, uh, so for the first couple of months, for example, what we know is there's around 60 to 70,000 individuals who since they have come on to Sooner Care have never accessed a service. They've never gone to the doctor and billed a Sooner Care service. They didn't need pharmacy. More than likely they came on to Medicaid when they needed us, probably during a time of short unemployment and then gained employment and got employer-sponsored insurance and never needed Sooner Care and just never chose to disenroll because it's not on their radar. Um, so, of course, that group would be targeted for those earlier unenrollment months. So uh, our first unenrollment will actually be April the 30th. So they would be targeted in that first group. So then we look at things like, uh, are there any children under the age of five in the family? And we are grouping families together. So that's say mom and dad and a couple of kids are on Sooner Care, but they both have different certification dates. They have different needs. Um, we don't want mom and dad and kids all rolling off in different months because we know that creates more fragmentation and care received. So we're grouping families together and we're identifying their unenrollment date based on the highest need of any member of that family. So if kiddo has a lot of needs, mom and dad don't, they'll still be targeted as a family towards the end of that nine month period. Um, so we look at things like, are there children under the age of five in that family? Uh, do, what is their federal poverty limit? Where do they exist on the spectrum of income? So if they're over 280% when the percentage for expansion, for example, is 138, we would target them for an earlier unenrollment because there's more options to those families through the federally, uh, for federal exchange or other um, lower reduced cost services in their communities. So that's kind of what it looks like. We have identified, and then with those that are in the middle of an episode of care. So if you have an individual that's in the middle of a residential substance use disorder stay, we're not gonna end their Sooner Care coverage in the middle of that. We would target them towards later enrollment. We look at chronic conditions, multiple comorbidities, and again, pharmacy costs. So that at that very November, December mark, it's really gonna be our highest needs that we've made sure that we can help them as long as we can through the unwinding period. 
Um, so our focus has been, um, kind of going back to your point about making sure we've done everything we can to make sure our members know this is coming and that it's about to happen. Our first phase of communication really started in 2021 with um, a real robust campaign. Uh, we did a lot of news media, print, TV around just go to mysoonercare.org and update your information. Make sure we have your most up-to-date phone number, your address, uh, your income information, because that constitutes a renewal for our purpose. We want to make sure we know how to get a hold of you when it's time. So we spent about a year doing that. Phase two kicked off in February of this year with what we refer to as our purple letter. We uh, wanted to make sure the mailing stood out in our in, in individual's mailbox because no one's been watching for Sooner Care uh, notices for the last three years. I know that when I get health choice notices, for example, I usually don't even open them because I know the state pays for my insurance and I really need to. And I know that's terrible as a healthcare administrator, but um, we wanted to make sure it stood out. So the purple letter basically went to everyone that we've targeted as you're potentially ineligible. And we want to make sure you know to go to mysoonercare.org, update your account. And we also let them know these are the next steps to be looking for in your mailbox. And so that was the first notice. Um, and then in March, um, you may or may not know this, but every January, the feds update the income thresholds for all state Medicaid programs. And so because of that, we have to update our system to then match a new income standard. So we did all of that in March. Uh, so we had the most up-to-date information on the new income standards, where people fell. Um, our PHE protected numbers went down a little bit because of that, because income thresholds went up a little bit. Uh, so from there, we sent out another letter saying, okay, uh, based on income information known to us, uh, it looks like you are either eligible, here's your new certification end date, or it appears you're ineligible, and now we need you to go do a full reapplication or a renewal process. So then we sent another letter 45 days out from that individual or that family's projected end date. So at this point, now we're looking at those individual groups, those months that I just referred to. So for example, the April cohort, um, what would have been Mar March 15th, got their 45-day letter saying, we need you to go do a full renewal, uh, update your information, and that was their official notice. Um, from there, we expect that they do that process. If they had not conducted that process, they then get a letter 10 days prior to their end date. So actually any day now, they'll get that 10-day letter if they're in the April cohort, for example, saying it's really serious, really go in, update your information, take some action either way. Um, we also have very robust processes in place for return mail. We know our folks move around a lot. Uh, so what happens if we get a piece of return mail? Um, it means we check other data sources. So we go in and we uh, look in our, fi our files. If they haven't updated it, we put a flag on the provider file. So if they go to their primary care physician, for example, when they're checking eligibility on that individual, there's going to be an indicator that says they need up to update their information. Uh, we will also go all the way through an outbound call is the very last process. If we haven't heard from you, we'll do an outbound call and check. Uh, we're also able to leverage the state's health information exchange to get data matching from that. So again, I went to my PCP the other day. As you can tell, I'm kind of sinusy. Um, it's just allergies. But uh, I went there and they asked for your new phone number and your address every time you visit. So we know that's going to be the most recent in the HIE. So we're matching with that to make sure we have all the most recent up-to-date information to really make sure we're doing everything we can to outreach to those members. Um, we will be making a formal announcement, uh, but we are partnering with an organization that's going to take it even a step further um, that can bring a level of data analytics that we don't currently have uh, at the Healthcare Authority that will assess the social determinant needs and healthcare needs and health uh, insurance needs of individuals that have been targeted for unenrollment. They will help with the um, uh, hands-on navigation to the marketplace, for example. They will also work with uh, organizations like the Health Alliance for the Uninsured, Primary Care Association, to make sure those individuals, if they don't, if they haven't gotten access through the marketplace, that they have access to those the free and charitable clinics, and make sure that they have a, a certain level of continuity of care. Um, that's important to our community as a whole, but also the Medicaid agency, because we want to make sure that these individuals have the supports they need so that they don't have to come back to Sooner Care. If we give them the resources and supports they need now to be healthy, to access care when they need it and not wait on emergency care, it helps the system as a whole. Um, so I know the, the folks to my right uh, will have a lot more details about how it impacts our safety net clinics and some more information. But um, uh, again, we're just putting a lot of thought into this. And I, I see some folks in the room that have given us feedback as to the process. 
Uh, I always say, uh, as good of a job as our staff does, I, I've yet in my 18 years to roll out a large scale project like this without any bumps, and that's just to be expected. Um, so we welcome that feedback and want to work with you. If you hear things along the way that we're doing things that could be done a little better, let me know. Um, and, we're, and we're happy to, to change course on that. So thanks. If I use the podium? Yes. Okay. You too. And there's a mic here too as well. Okay. If you want to use this one. Good afternoon to everyone who's here and everyone who's out into the vast uh, world of virtual attendance. I am Michael Figgins, and I am the Executive Director of Legal Aid Services of Oklahoma, affectionately known as LASSO. Uh, Lasso uh, has an extensive experience with healthcare. Uh, certainly, uh, Lasso is at the intersection of poverty and then something better than poverty, and that's what Lasso strives to do, to make lives better than they are. Uh, the clients that Lasso sees, and we serve the entire state, uh, certainly are weary. Uh, they're exhausted. They have lots of fears. They fear eviction. They fear tooth rot. They fear debt harassment and certainly suffocating their own dreams is all the poverty they have to deal with. And all too often, when I meet with the poor, I hear about loss, something being taken, and to those who start with something very little to begin with. So today we're talking about certainly a sacrifice for many in regard to health care. And you've heard the statistics. Uh, it's, it's approximately one out of four uh, are at risk of losing sooner care, and we're hoping that when the applicants reapply, that many will still be found to be eligible, but uh, we're dealing with what is called unwinding. Sounds like a Stephen King novel, doesn't it? Like, out at bookstores near you, the unwinding, like, oh, it sounds pretty scary. And it is scary. It can be certainly scary. Uh, and you know, there's no safety net, whether you live in urban Oklahoma or rural Oklahoma, you're going to be impacted as well. And um, many of the people who are being impacted have income. Income at such a level that will make them ineligible for Sooner Care, but they're employees. And in addition to being the executive director of Legal Aid, I am an employer of over 300 individuals across the state. We're the largest law firm in the state. And this is what I am thinking of doing, what I'm trying to do as an employer, is that I offer a health plan. And again, it's, it's a nice health plan, and, but it's only for employees. So if you have a wife or kids, you know, they could be part of a health plan, but it's going to cost more than it does for the employee. Uh, I'm aware that there are special enrollment periods from time to time where people can get on the Lasso health plan. It's usually 30 days, something like that, and it's periodically through the year, a window to get on the health plan. However, if you're losing Medicaid, you're losing Sooner Care, you'll have more than 30 days. You'll have up to 60 days. And uh, it's not all that well known that there's that extra, extra period of enrollment. And uh, there's never been this, this many Oklahomans losing Medicaid. So as an employer, I'm making sure that my employees know if you are on Sooner Care, if you're at risk of Sooner Care, if you're getting the letters, the purple ones, whatever, if you're getting those notices, you need to know that you have time to enroll in health insurance here at Lasso. And uh, certainly, I'm going to try to get as many staff as I can, uh, if they are on Sooner Care, on Lasso Health Insurance. And if the employees are losing Sooner Care, again, on or before July 10th, they can request that special enrollment. And I'm going to, again, encourage them all to do that. And they really can wait until September 8th to do so. So there's time to do so. I have time as an employer to do so. And as you heard, it's important that we communicate among all of us. The state's doing a wonderful job getting the word out. I, as an employer, I need to supplement that. You, as a consumer, need to supplement that to your family and friends. And this means that for the first time, for the first three months, again, Sooner Care is unwinding, but employees can enroll in their job-based plan through September 8th. But more specifically, I have to tell my employees, again, many of whom are on Sooner Care, uh, that uh, the, through the months, through April, through May, through June, that many of them will lose Sooner Care. 
and uh, the rest of the unwinding after July 31st, there's not going to be a special 90-day extension. It'll still be 60 days. But you're looking at approximately 30000 a month. And uh, again, communication with my employees, communication with your employees is so important. So there are people who don't have an employer option. They don't work for legal aid. They don't work for you. They don't have no insurance at all. Who are some of those people? Well, some of them do work at legal aid. They're called part-time people. Uh, they're called people who work on a contract. They could be self-employed. They don't have insurance, so I can't offer them, you know, the health insurance market. What, what, again, what I will offer them is the health insurance marketplace, which, again, Lasso helps to facilitate. Healthcare.gov, the Navigator program, a wonderful program that uh, is, is helping hundreds of thousands of Oklahomans get health care through the marketplace. Uh, most people qualify for discounts, so it's affordable. And again, you're not a full-time employee. You don't get legal aid, full-time employee benefits, but you can participate in marketplace. I need to tell my staff that. You need to tell your employees that as well. And marketplace offers dozens of plans. Uh, they have multiple private insurers, choices as far as doctors, hospitals, levels of premiums, deductibles, very, very flexible, and it works. Another consideration uh, is that sometimes my employee says, hey, great, I can get coverage. I'm full-time. I work at Legal Aid, but I can't afford coverage for my wife and kids through Legal Aid. What am I going to do? Uh, again, Marketplace will provide discounts, especially if that cost of insurance is very high, and I tell you, it is. And eligible children can stay on Sooner Care because the income requirement for kids is significantly higher than it is for adults. So I don't have any problem with one parent getting insurance from Legal Aid, the spouse getting insurance from Marketplace, and the kids on Sooner Care. Because to me, everybody's getting health care in that scenario. And the unwinding is not an unwinding for them, but a continuation of healthcare that they're used to having. So I can't stress, communication, communication. We need to talk among ourselves. And uh, the state is doing wonderful things. The state is responsible for all the information that's going out that you heard about, the application, renewal documents. In multiple languages, they're accommodating people who cannot speak English, who maybe cannot hear, who have issues with other disabilities. And again, to get the word out so everybody knows, and they're being told multiple times. And uh, again, as an employer, I need to do the same thing. I can't just rely on the state. I can't say, well, didn't you get a letter from the state? Well, sorry, it's not my fault. It is my fault. I have a responsibility to the same people. And uh, I'm hoping that the state can provide expedited renewals and use other state data that they may have on TANF to expedite uh, renewals for the, the many who may still qualify. And uh, if, if there is a need for appeal, certainly legal aid will accept appeals and do the advocacy for appeals, knowing that if there is medic, medical coverage during the appeal, that the applicant will not be responsible for those costs if the appeal is not ultimately successful. And uh, certainly, I need to continue. We need to continue to evaluate for other programs. Be aware of special enrollment. Manor Care Supplements, Marketplace, needs to post these in the break room, wherever you do it at, at your place of employment. And certainly, the Marketplace does not is not concerned with pre-existing conditions, whatever you may have that Sooner Care was covering. Again, Marketplace will take care of those as well. So what happens to me as an employer with no Sooner Care? Why do I care? Well, I know without Sooner Care, and if I'm not actively trying to get my employees on other health care benefits, they're going to get sick. We all get sick. It's not something It's just for the poor. We all get sick. If I have no health care, I'm going to get sicker. I'm not going to get it well very fast. I'm going to miss work. Or if I do show up to work, I may show up in a condition that may impact other employees. Like, oh, Michael showed up with an infectious disease. Make him go home. Uh, I'm not going to be the most productive worker maybe that I have in the past. They may say, well, Michael just ain't cutting it anymore. And uh, certainly, I'll probably have to go to the emergency room at some point and that's going to run up premiums all across the board for 
everyone for health insurance. It's going to cost more for insurance companies because I have to go to the emergency room because I have no health care coverage. So I don't want that. I don't want that for my employers. I don't want that for my business. So again, communication. And certainly there are aspects of it that need to be shared. For example, I have, oh, I'm, I don't know what it, why it is. I must have a handful, at least a half a dozen employees who are pregnant. And at least half of them are on Sooner Care. And they're like, oh, what am I going to do? I'm going to be pregnant for a while, and I'm going to have this kid, and I'm not going to have any health care insurance. Well, they will, up to up as much as 12 months following the end of the pregnancy. And uh, no conditions support the child support that I'm aware of. But uh, it's going to be a struggle for all of us. But I am pleased that everyone in this room is part of the solution. We're all working together. There's no you know, adversarial, like we're going to do this or you better do that. We're all working for the same cause. And I'm confident that at Legal Aid, I mean, we're going to continue to do what we can to advocate on behalf of people seeking Sooner Care, working with the navigators, adults, and children across the state to make sure they have every aspect of health care they need. And uh, to basically uh, be a partner with all of you uh, in every capacity you are, and there's a table in the back of this room. I'm sorry if you're here virtually. But uh, on that table, I'm going to leave my business cards. I'm not leaving a pamphlet or a brochure. And invite you to email me for whatever reason you want to. And I assure you that I will give you prompt attention. Whatever you may need. If you need guidance, you need legal advice, you need just re re reaffirmation of what I said could be true and what you heard today was true. Uh, legal Aid is here for you. And we will continue to be here for you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Patty Davis, Oklahoma Hospital Association. And Janine asked me to speak because hospitals have emergency rooms and those are considered safety net providers. I'm here because what we do not want to hear in emergency rooms is a statement, I didn't know I lost coverage. Because let's face it, as individuals, we all get really busy. And Trailer, I'm with you on notices. I'm not on health choice, but Blue Cross pelts me with uh -huh, too many papers. Do I read them? Not very well. And I mean, and I understand them. So for people to get something in the mail, or maybe they've moved and they didn't get something in the mail, or they say, we will do this later. And then when they find themselves in need, they find out, oh, I really should have turned that document back. I should have gone online. We do not want that to happen because Oklahomans have options. And you've heard Trailer speak. You've heard Michael speak to say, for people rolling off that are no longer eligible for Medicaid, likely they're going to be able to qualify for the exchange with subsidy. So then you're going to hear from my colleagues to my right, your left, about options they provide. I want to be very clear, hospital emergency rooms are a lousy place to get primary care. Most expensive place, you wait a long time. We don't want to see people driving to emergency rooms for basic primary care. We want them to be in a medical home, which means they have a regular provider that knows about them and they have records there and they can get continual care not episodic, very expensive care in the emergency room. So what are we doing as an association? Clearly, the key word today is about communication, and that's everyone's job. I want to be very clear. Sooner care means Medicaid. Medicaid means sooner care. I can't tell you how many conversations I've had with folks saying, well, I'm not on Medicaid. I have a sooner care card. You are on Medicaid. Okay, so if you are getting these notifications, please heed the advice and do proactively what you need to do. But secondly, I will tell you, those of you in the audience, I doubt that there's anyone sitting here that doesn't have a family member or someone in your church or someone in your neighborhood that's not affected by this. Inquire. You know, I think it's important to note that most people think, oh, great, there's a QR code. Oh, great, there's a website. If you do not have a phone, if you do not have a computer, you are at a disadvantage. 
So if there are people in your circle, ask the question. And if they need help, help them. So what we're doing with our hospitals is to make sure that they have the resources of the healthcare authority. And by the way, congratulations on a very well thought out unwinding plan that makes a whole lot of sense. And then we have partners like Legal Aid that have people to help navigate every step of the way. So let's not let people fall through the cracks. Let's get them pointed in the right direction. And if it requires a little bit more hand holding to see it through, let's get that done. Because as Michael said, you should care if you're an employer or if you just pay your own health, insur health insurance premium for care that is not provided coverage with or Medicaid or insurance plans, most of that care ends up being uncompensated care. We all pay for that. And these uh, two speakers following me are going to talk about the wonderful services that they have. But my number one thing is let's communicate. And it's all of our jobs to make sure people understand this and they know what's there and let's not leave anyone behind. So that's it. Um, can you advance to the next slide? Okay, and one more. Great, thanks. Uh, my name is uh, Sarah Berry, and as uh, Sarah Barrow mentioned, um, I am with the Oklahoma Primary Care Association, and we are the state trade association for um, Oklahoma's network of community health centers, or CHCs. We're also known as FQHCs, which stands for Federally Qualified Health Centers. But those terms are interchangeably. Community health centers, federally qualified health centers, it refers to the same provider type. Um, what we do, um, CHCs provide affordable community-based primary mental and dental health care through our statewide network of over 160 sites through our 22 member organizations. Our community health centers here in the Oklahoma City area are Community Health Centers of Oklahoma, which was, is also known as Mary Mahoney, and Variety Care. We have a long history of addressing patients' social determinants of health needs, such as transportation, food insecurity, language barriers, so that they can have positive health, health outcomes. We provide those primary care um, patient-centered medical home services, which Patty referenced. And we are part of what is known as the healthcare safety net. This map shows um, our 22 health centers and where we are located. You can switch to the next slide. Um, I am also showing you the community behavioral health organizations because our panelist, uh, Julia Jernigan-Smith, could not be here. She's with the Behavioral Health Association, um, which is also part of the safety net. And today was a deadline day, and she is stuck at the Capitol. And so I am um, playing her on TV. So <laughs> um, this is their network of community behavioral health organizations, which also, as I mentioned, are part of the safety net. There are 25 um, behavioral health organizations that are part of the Behavioral Health Association. They are also throughout the state. Um, and we have five of those that are part of our clinically, joint clinically integrated network. So we'll be working together to try and coordinate care for these patients. Um, our, our provider networks are also working to identify the patients um, and help them to get um, documentation submitted so they do not lose coverage. Next slide. So as you can see, um, over 90% of Oklahomans are within a 30-minute drive of one of our locations. So um, we do cover the state. We are in these communities. So we have a, a good reach to be able to reach these patients, um, identify them, and try and capture, um, you know, catch them and help them to get the documentation submitted so they do not lose coverage. That is our primary concern. And then beyond that, if they do not meet eligibility anymore than helping to get them connected to, um, as uh, Michael was mentioning, either coverage through their employer um, or through the marketplace. And again, just as Michael mentioned, what all of us can do as employers is to help to spread the word to um, 
people in our community to the other businesses to, to be aware and please help your employees um, to capture the coverage through your um, through your employer sponsored insurance plan if you're lose if they are losing coverage through sooner care. Next slide. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Yay team. Okay. Uh, last year, our 22 member organizations served over 300,000 Oklahomans, so uh, 332,674 uh, to be exact. Of those, um, roughly 45%, so 147,729 were covered through Medicaid. And we are estimating that over 50,000 of these patients, or about 25 to 30%, will be impacted by this um, public health emergency unwinding. Um, so as you can see, it is um, a significant number of our patients. So we have been working uh, very closely with the healthcare authority and uh, trying to identify who these patients are to so that we can provide outreach to them and assist them with submitting the required documentation. Um, uh, we, Cassidy Height, who is here with us, made some purple buttons to match the purple letter that say, ask me about my Sooner Care. So we provided these to all of our organizations for their staff to wear. We brought some here today that we will give you guys as a um, party favor, I guess, for attending today. So uh, kudos to Cassidy. And it was her idea to make it purple to match your letter trailer. So, all right, and last slide. Um, it shows, um, this is actually trailers, uh, the healthcare authority slide, but this is a map that shows the number of patients per county that are set to lose Medicaid coverage. I can kick it back to you, trailer, if there's anything you want to share about this slide in particular, but this really can help people know the areas where the largest patient populations um, are that are set to you know, lose, and it gives you an idea of how many people in each county um, could potentially be impacted. Is there anything you want to add on that one? Or? Uh, you know, for us, the importance of this map was uh, not only for infographics for things like this, but also uh, for our legislative partners. So we wanted to make sure that our legislative partners who have actually have been very invested in this process and wanted to make sure that we don't miss a step and have been really uh, great partners, of course, along with the governor's office, but informing them, this is what your how your district is gonna be impacted because we know by losing sooner care, that's loss of dollars in our healthcare infrastructure system and making sure that they're prepared when their offices get called, so. And a thank you to the journal record because they will be providing to every legislator a copy of the um, write-up that um, will um, be from today's panel so that they will all receive that information. And that's all I have for my piece, so it's for Janine now. Hmm. Thank you, Sarah and panel. Wow, what a great presentation from everybody. And um, I love being uh, last but not least because we also have an important message from the Health Alliance for the Uninsured. And first of all, I want to recognize many of the Health Alliance for the Uninsured team that are here today and the great work that they're doing. And I'll be um, sharing about how we support the safety net as well. And I love that you mentioned the legislatures because they're, as we were talking about different myths and clarification. Um, when we had Medicaid expansion almost two years ago, um, there was a myth that that um, solved all the uninsured and healthcare access issues. And that's really very far from the truth. We have about 535,000 uninsured people, not even talking about the ones that'll be unwinding. We have an additional almost 100,000 people that are undocumented that are also uninsured. And then we add the 308,000 unwinding, we get close to almost a million people that really need to get access to health care. And that's about a quarter of our state's population. So this really is a crisis. And that's why when they say communication, it's really important that we understand who is the health care safety net. Health Alliance for the Uninsured, we're a catalyst to health care to those who would be uh, un unable otherwise to obtain it. So we're not the first stop. We're the last stop, but we're hoping that nobody gets through those cracks. The first stop is to be an insured individual to help um, support 
your, and your own health in addition to our healthcare system so that we can have a strong, healthy, vibrant healthcare community. It's so important. We have a state that's very unhealthy and we really would like to improve those health outcomes. And that's with everybody, you know, not delaying our healthcare, managing chronic health conditions, all the things that help us to be able to be productive members of society, including having um, uh, jobs, employer jobs that'll pay for um, health insurance. If that's not an option, working with the legal aid team or the marketplace navigators to help in one and the same, there's different ways to access them. But be, maybe a marketplace plan is the way to go and you could have a Blue Cross plan or United Health or something like that that's available, maybe with a tax credit that makes it more affordable. There's tribal health centers. Um, I like that Sarah also mentioned our behavioral health centers. It's really important that our brains are a huge part of our body as well. We wanna have whole person health care. Um, the hospitals, we want people to go to the hospital appropriately. You know, not using the emergency department as the healthcare home, but have your have a uh, family doctor, a primary care home, and then you know when you need a higher level of care, that's what the hospitals are there for. Um, then, you know, as, and then of course we have the federally qualified health centers or community health centers, which are a wonderful part of our community and continue to grow. We have locally we have variety care that opens up location after location, and that's a great place both for insured. Um, in, which includes Medicaid, Sooner Care, and the uninsured to go on a sliding scale. So sometimes that's the affordable option. Sometimes we have people that even a sliding scale is not going to be affordable. And we're really blessed in Oklahoma. We have 92 free and charitable clinics in our state. Nationally, there's 1,400 free and charitable clinics. So it really speaks to the heart of Oklahomans. And I feel like we're a best kept secret because a lot of these free clinics have availability and would love to serve more people. That's their ministry, their mission. And um, about 90% of them are volunteers. So they're really doing this altruistically from the bottom of their hearts. But they're not just doing doing it um, without lack of skill. We have some of the most highly credentialed volunteers in any nonprofit sector that are volunteering at these, at these free clinics. And so we have a team of wonderful people that I pointed out earlier that are providing five really important programs. And one of the most important ones that is important for everyone to know because we, we know people that are uninsured. And that is that there's navigators available. And our healthcare services department navigation team, which is also bilingual, will help connect people to healthcare. And that starts out with maybe are you Medicaid eligible, maybe a marketplace plan, maybe going to an FQHC, a community health center. If none of those are an option, now let's see what we can do to get you into one of our free clinics. They all vary. They're autonomous, so they have different hours, different requirements. Our team is very savvy in knowing how to make those connections, and it's a closed-loop referral. So a week later or whenever it's appropriate timing, they're making sure that those people got access to health care. It's huge. Then HAU, Health Alliance for the Uninsured, we help serve those free clinics in a variety of ways so they can be the health care home, and we're providing um, specialty referrals through our office, prescription assistance. We have a program for uninsured diabetic patients. And then in addition, just being an overall resource, we, during um, the peak of the pandemic, we were providing mask gloves, things like that. We also provide a lot of education and training. Or for example, maybe your doctor's office is closing and you have a bunch of wonderful materials and supplies you would like to donate. We can send that out to our network and get those put to good use. So I'm really honored to be a part of the panel today and thank you for hosting us, Journal Record. You know, I, I, as I sat and listened to all of you speak, I thought about how serious this issue really is. And sometimes those of us who have insurance, you know, take it for granted. We don't realize that the things that we're talking about today for some people are truly life or death uh, situations. Uh, I listened to you, Trailer. Thank you for taking good care of the Medicaid program. That's kind of my baby. I don't know if you know the history, but it was my bill when I was a legislator that created the Oklahoma Health Care Authority. But it didn't come just because we thought we needed to separate the Medicaid program from DHS. It came because I had a failed bill to create universal access to health care uh, for everyone in Oklahoma. Yeah, you can say this was this left-leaning liberal person, 
But no, it wasn't. It was a person who believed that every individual was entitled to high access to high quality health care services. And so I appreciate what you do and your sincerity and the information and your willingness to work with organizations like mine and many others in the room to make sure that people, again, don't inadvertently lose coverage. And uh, my friends at Legal Aid, I mean, number one champion for individuals, not just for health care, but as Michael said, for a whole lot of issues that poor individuals actually have to burden and shoulder every day of their lives. And, and you know, accessing health care should not be one of those things. It's fundamental to children learning and to parents working. Uh, Patty, Patty didn't say it, but she represents a whole lot of hospitals across the state of Oklahoma, and they are concerned about the shishing, a uh, little money and resources. So, um, not you know, Patty does it because she knows the importance of healthcare services, but it is important. Healthcare is a huge industry; it's a, probably this still this nation's largest single industry, and uh, these providers just don't do it because they. Um, want to, they need to, of course, but they have to be compensated. So ensuring that uh, people have coverage, a payor is important to all providers of federally qualified health centers need resources. Yeah, you get some federal dollars and we got you some little state dollars. It's not enough, uh, but it's important for them because you heard 45% of your patients are Medicaid patients. That's a revenue source that's important to uh, the federally qualified health centers so they can continue to provide coverage on a sliding fee scale. And I just take my hat off to the Alliance, Health Alliance for the Uninsured, individuals who volunteer uh, their services. I got a kid who's a first year med student, and all she talks about is when she gets an opportunity to go in Ohio to the free clinics to help and to work. So we know that providers do believe, uh, just like we do, in the importance of providing care. And my hat off to you and all of the people, all those 90 some clinics that really step up to the plate as the last resource. Maybe one of these days, I don't want to put you out of business necessarily, but maybe one of these days we'll figure it out. So I hope that was just a stretch long enough for many of you out there to think about the questions that you want to ask uh, some of these individuals here. So um, I know your names too, so I can make up questions and ask you directly. Um, so I can tell you their names as well, so you can ask some questions directly. Let me just open the floor. Uh, we don't have mics for you. Speak loudly. I will repeat your question because this is being recorded for playback later. Uh, but I'm certain I, I know many of you and I know your names as well. So please, are there questions for any of our panelists, any or all of our panelists? Yes, we have one here. Yes, ma'am. The question was, uh, how can a family of individuals qualify for multiple coverage plans? Sooner care, the marketplace, possibly even, to confuse it more, employer-based coverage. So I'm going to add to that question so any of you and all of you can respond to that. Uh, but how, in terms of this public health emergency unwinding, again, and Trailer, that would be your question, how, how are you going to ensure that that family situation continues to have coverage? So I'll start from a sooner care standpoint, um, and great point, Patty, about Medicaid to sooner care in Oklahoma. Um, so as was alluded to earlier, so a family, mom and dad could be under the expansion population. So their income is going to be at 138% of the federal poverty level. Uh, kiddos coverage is 185%. And so mom and dad may lose coverage for sooner care, and then they could pursue coverage on the marketplace, but kiddo is still covered uh, through their coverage. Um, mom may work for an employer that ha maybe it's um, not affordable for her to add uh, dad to her plan so she can purchase through her employer. And then dad is the only one in the family that then goes to the marketplace to get uh, uh, coverage to the marketplace. Okay, great. Additional questions, please. I'm going to ask a question. Uh, and panelists, feel free to ask one another questions. I mean, golly gee, we're all in this together. Do we have a question here? Yes, ma'am. We have two. Let's get the, uh, this young, young person and then the gentleman in the tie.
so the question is, um, the healthcare authority is conducting quite a bit of outreach to ensure that people know about the public health unwinding. And be, based upon that outreach and that public information campaign, are you actually getting a response? Are people calling and asking, are responding, updating information? What does that response look like, Trailer? A great question. So I will say over the last two years, our number has, uh, it's, it's fluctuated, but it goes down incrementally. So which tells me that folks are going into their account, updating it, uh, making sure we have the most up-to-date information as well as our data pings uh, with other uh, data sources. So far, our calls are ticking up, not considerably, but we do expect them again. Our first enrollments will be April 30th. So we expect traffic to really go up then, because uh, that's when the first, you know, like, oh my gosh, where's my coverage, right? Uh, so we expect it to go up, but we're starting to see it trickle in. Um, one of the things that uh, the Healthcare Authority has created too is um, information um, as far as communicating this and toolkits. So what all of us can do is push it out through our organizational and our individual social medias to help in spreading the word. And I think that's something everyone here can do. And it's a good toolkit. It is. It is a good, good toolkit. And we contract with five little, small community grassroots organizations that use that information plus some more. And uh, they're not knocking doors, but they're setting up booths in front of grocery stores even to make sure that, and using that map and some zip codes, work in those areas where we know there are a high number of people who potentially would lose coverage. Yes, sir. And the question was for patients, sooner care beneficiaries who are uh, experiencing some catastrophic medical condition or in the midst of some treatment long term, such as cancer, uh, what is the healthcare authority doing to ensure that that coverage, that care, that care continues for those individuals? Great question. So again, I'll start by saying those individuals will be targeted towards a later kind of eighth, ninth month if they're in the middle of an episode of care there. Um, and it also kind of goes to the partner I mentioned earlier that we'll have an official announcement on. They're really going to be an extension of the healthcare authorities care management team. And so they can, uh, they have a closed loop referral system, getting them access to care that's free and charitable. Also having kind of a hands-on white glove approach and, and assisting with navigation to the marketplace if that's an option. Uh, unfortunately, um, as we all know, once, they're un once they can no longer meet eligibility as of 2024, there's nothing healthcare authority do can pay for service. Um, now I'll remind everyone, we do have the breast and cervical cancer program, which has a different income threshold and we will maintain that um, uh, and, and all those things. Now I will say that if it results in like longer term disability, uh, we would be working with an individual through our care coordinators to make sure they're going through the disability application process to get on a different form of sooner care uh, that can pro <coughs> help pay for theirs in, more, in a more prolonged way if it's needed. Follow up. Would you explain, not a catastrophic condition, but a woman that's pregnant, mm -hmm. what happens there? Great question. Uh, so, and it's a great plug for a new expanded benefit. We just recently, as of January 1st, uh, expanded our pregnancy income threshold from 138% to 185%. We estimate that to be around 2,500 additional moms in Oklahoma will now have coverage through Sooner Care. Uh, we've also expanded our postpartum coverage from 60 days to 12 months, again, effective January the 1st. Um, thanks for bringing that up, Patty, because what we're doing, uh, let's say mom delivered in October or, or at some point where there's, uh, we don't want to end her 12 months prematurely. So we're going back and kind of doing a manual review of all the pregnant moms in our program um, that could have had extended postpartum period so that we're not unintentionally un, uh, putting them in an, uh, a premature unwinding bucket over the next nine months. Um, and also an important distinction about the pregnancy coverage is it's continuous, which is different from typical regular expansion in Title 19 Sooner Care. Continuous coverage means regardless of uh, change in circumstance or income, you are guaranteed Sooner Care coverage for 12 months. Uh, also beginning in 2024, that same continuous coverage will apply to children. Uh, so beginning January 1st of 24, kids on the program again will have that continuous 12 months of coverage regardless of any incomes changes during the year. 
additional questions from the audience. Yes, let's get this one and that one and one more. All right, yes, ma'am. And the question was, in terms of the percentage of Oklahomans who are losing coverage, and I'll maybe qualify that just a bit, to also the percentage of Medicaid beneficiaries who are losing coverage, uh, how do we compare with other states? We're pretty much on track, uh, pro rata compared to overall population. Uh, I will say I had a number in my head, but I'm afraid to say it. I'm not, I think I might be getting confused with something else. But overall, nationally, it's a large number. Uh, we're pretty much on par with other states. Of course, like the California is going to have a really large PHE unwinding number, but it, we're fairly on track considering our total population. And in the back? I just want to clarify, you said uh, in terms of the people who enrolled in the expansion, do you really mean the expansion population or those who are retaining coverage through the public health emergency? Through the expansion population. Yes. Right. Yes. So for the record, the question is, of the expansion population, how many are really continuing to coverage, continuing to utilize coverage, or are regular users of coverage? And then specifically, uh, how many of those individuals does it appear are actually taking advantage? Because the dental coverage was expanded. Uh, so there's, for adults, for sure, how many uh, of those individuals are really taking advantage? Uh, and you know, you can quantify it any way you want. Percentages, hard numbers, it doesn't matter. But how many of those people are utilizing the dental coverage? No, it's a great question. Um, I came with all my PHE facts in my brain, so I, my expansion facts in my brain are not readily accessible. But I will say at this point, I think we're around 330,000 individuals that are now covered through expansion. Uh, not all of those folks are new to us, so we had things like soon-to-be Sooners and uh, uh, Intra Oklahoma, for example. Uh, so about 330,000. I will say that some things that have stood out is we're seeing a lot of hospital procedures with this population, high cost in the pharmacy arena. Um, we are also seeing, uh, surprisingly, in a good way to me, a lot of the uh, kind of young and invincibles that kind of have not seen a value in health insurance. So that's at 20, you know, one to 26 kind of, there's a lot of enrollment around those folks, uh, which has been great. Um, hopefully we've really been getting the message out with the newer generation about the importance of primary care. I will say, again, we, are, we expanded the dental benefit about a year and a half ago, which was really exciting and needed in the state. We've not seen as great of an uptick there, mostly because we don't have a as robust of a provider network to serve adults in the dental arena. Now, thankful to our partners like at the, our, our community health clinics have very good dental services. We've seen cooperation like mobile dental clinics get into rural areas. We have dug into that to see if it's a reimbursement issue. So we have raised rates, for example, for our dental providers, specifically for adults, to see if that helps. Um, it also kind of helps me give a plug for our new service delivery model, uh, Sooner Select. So we will be going to a managed care delivery system in early, probably first quarter of 2024. Uh, we have selected two dental plans, Liberty Dental and DentaQuest, who are managed uh, the, the dental benefit for the majority of our Sooner Care population. They're going to bring a level of resources to the table that we don't have as a state agency in terms of outreach. They'll have a lot more flexibility in terms of variable rates that they can pay for their provider network. Whereas if you've worked in the Sooner Care Network as a provider, you know, if we pay one provider something, we pay all providers the same. And so they can have differentials regarding like urban and rural splits, for example. So we're really hoping through that process that we'll be able to really build out our dental infrastructure. Can I add a little to that? Um, I, I'm not going to be able to give you numbers, but prior to COVID and when we were starting down the Medicaid expansion road, we believed that ultimately there would be 200 to 250,000 Oklahomans 
that would be eligible for coverage. And it is, I, I watch it monthly and it's around 3.30, but we know that has been skewed because of the pandemic and also the ability to uh, keep people on during the maintenance of effort. But I will tell you this, it, it's been interesting as hard as the last three years have been for hospitals, uh, particularly the last surge when there were no federal funds that flowed into Oklahoma to help. What our members are telling us that they're thankful that we did expansion because they're saying their uncompensated care numbers have dwindled. Prior to Medicaid expansion, we were number two, only behind Texas at about 19% of our population being uninsured, and that's dropped. And it's good to see Oklahoma not in that number two range. And we know the pandemic and everything that we're talking about today has had an impact, but it's still the right thing to do for Oklahomans. Um, we, ha too, have seen um, with our uh, provider organizations, we just got our um, numbers from our organizations from uh, 2022 last year, and we have um, seen a big drop in the uh, number of uninsured and an increase in the number of individuals who have Medicaid coverage. So um, now, as this PHE unwinds, we'll go right back to where we were because it's pretty much a wash. But but we we want to uh, you know present prevent anyone from unnecessarily losing coverage that still maintains eligibility. So that is our priority. Continuing to provide health insurance is always an issue. It's been an issue. I started down this path in the late 70s, early 80s, and we were at number one, number two, number three, always in the percentage of our population that's uninsured. And uh, so it's always going to be a challenge for us. But Oklahoma's doing uh, really some, making some great strides recently to do so. I just want you to know one of my uh, coworkers uh, sat on the phone for about four hours, made about 28 calls looking for dental services before she could find someone. And so you'll know she ended up at the Perry Clausen Center, one of the federally qualified health centers. So you had a follow-up question, ma'am? Uh, very, uh, no worries. Thank you very much. Sarah, Sarah? Sorry. I have something else I want to add. Um, <laughs> One of the things is it is a complicating factor in that not only do we have low rates of um, insurance coverage, but we have very poor health outcomes. So we're um, in the top for uninsured, and then we're in the bottom for um, for our health status. So that is um, creates you know, a, it, it, yeah, it is for sure. And I just want to acknowledge um, uh, former Senator Angela Munson. Many of our organizations would not be here if it was not for her. And you have done so much to promote health in our state. And there is no better person to be moderating this today because truly, you're, you're a hero. Thank you. Thank, thank you. It's actually from the heart. Don't definitely know that. Trivia question Trivia. for the audience. <laughs> okay. So I was asked when we were very much engaged in Medicaid expansion, it's like, when was the last time eligibility was expanded in Oklahoma? And I say, Senate Bill 169 by Angela Munson passed in 1997 that raised eligibility for pregnant women kids to 185%. So it was a long time. That's it. been a long time. And I can tell you about the first time and a fight I had with Senator Howard Hendrick. And I was just representing some folks that were group of community clinics who wanted right. to expand Medicaid. Uh, predates the Primary Care Association. There was a question, Diana. The question simply was initially a thank you to Mr. Raines for publishing the Healthcare Authority's unwinding plan related to the PHE. And then the question simply was, will the Department of Human Services actually publish their unwinding plan if it's different, or will they utilize yours? That's a great question. So as a refresher for everyone in the audience, uh, we have kind of various populations we manage. But the bulk of that, the eligibility is done by the Healthcare Authority through online enrollment. The age-blind, disabled, long-term care population, that's still very much a county-based paper system that's administered through our sister agency of human services. Uh, their plan differs a little from ours. I don't know that it, it's uh, going to be published separately. Uh, I will say we're a little divergent in our dates. 
<clears throat> pardon me. So they their first day for unwinding or unenrollment was April 1st. So their first cohort, it was around 2,300 individuals. Um, kind of going to your point earlier about uh, appeals, those individuals have 90 days to appeal, so we're not considering them completely terminated yet. Uh, coverage stays active during the appeal process, even if they are not successful at the end of that. So it's a little different. I will say that their level of sophistication and technology is not such as ours is. And so we are working with them. So ex for example, they're sending us a flat file of all their unenrolled individuals so we can put them through our algorithms and send those folks over to the health to the marketplace ourselves so that there's uh, notified of additional coverage through there. Um, <clears throat> But it's, it's actually a good point, and we may look about amending our plan to include that non magi population. And, and I'm going to follow that up because I'm going to follow that up with this uh, question because it's like DHS has a clientele, the healthcare authority has a clientele. Please tell us the difference. Great, <clears throat> great point. So the main, we kind of diverged from each other circa 2011, 2012. Um, there's two different populations. Some are very just income-based. So most of Sooner Care through expansion, we're just looking at income. Uh, you either do or you don't make above or below the income level and you qualify for services. Uh, the other group, long-term care or those uh, considered age-blind disabled by the Social Security Administration, there's a resource test for that. So as we all know, if you've had loved ones going to nursing homes, for example, you know, we're, we're looking to see, do you own property? Do you have assets? There's a look back period. It's very complicated, not something you can just push through a rules engine or an algorithm in a computer. So it's still very much a paper-based manual process that humans utilize on the Department of Human Service side. Um, we made the decision for the healthcare authority to administer the, um, the rules-based part because we, we, as a healthcare authority, did not have a county presence. Uh, human services had, uh, up until recently, had county offices in most counties, and so members can go in there and they can calculate it and help them work through that paperwork. Um, so which is why we kind of left that population with them. Diana? And that, my friends, was a commercial, that the Legal Aid Services of Oklahoma does provide assistance to individuals who are going through these uh, enrollment or eligibility challenges, not just for uh, folk at the Oklahoma Health Care Authority, but folk who may be eligible through the Department of Human Services categories. All right, one additional question, and we're getting close to the end, so give us just a few more minutes, and we're going to wind up. Let, let me try it for, again, for the record. Uh, you're with Community Action Agency, Oklahoma Canadian County? All right, very good. Okay, the RX program. Uh, RX program provides patient assistance assistance to pharmaceutical access. The question simply is, uh, Medicaid beneficiaries are allowed six prescriptions a month. Uh, and is there any plan to expand that number? Or I'm going to add to that. Any suggestions what a person should do if they exceed that number? Yes, yeah, so it's something we've looked at over the years. Uh, the number has kind of gone up or down over the years whenever we've had to institute cost savings measures. You know, that we're, in, you know, the silver lining of all this COVID stuff is we have a lot of money in the state right now, uh, especially in the healthcare net and industry. Um, and so because of that, uh, we're not experiencing those lean years where we've had to reduce that number. We continue to look at that number. Um, it comes down to cost overall. As you can, pharmacy is a very large cost driver. We know there's a need there, of course. But right now, I don't. We don't have it in the budget to go up any more than six. What I will say, kind of going to as what can an individual do? Um, let's say you have six prescriptions and your seventh is the, to go through the system is very high cost compared to maybe a two dollar 
you know, medication that you may pay out of pocket otherwise. If it hits the system that way, they can always call our pharmacy help desk and they can rearrange which dollars are paid through Medicaid and rather than out of pocket and help that individual work through, let's make sure all your higher cost drugs go through the sooner care system so that you're able to afford those lower cost drugs out of pocket if you have hit your six limit, for example. It's a great, it's a great thought uh, for individuals. Well, we're, uh, one more question, Steve. <laughs> That was another legal aid commercial by Steve Goldman, who is the lead navigator in the state of Oklahoma, encouraging people to go to myokplan.org. My, M-Y-O-K-P-L-A-N.org. Is that correct? Uh, and it is, a, I've seen the homepage. It's a great tool to get you step by step through this process. So if you have internet access, uh, go there. And if you know someone who doesn't have internet access, give them a hand. Uh, was there one additional question that I missed? I have one, but I'm not going to ask it. But I just want to, if you can, I will ask it to each of you and just as succinctly as you can. Uh, and I hate to even ask this because it's like ended on a bad note. But um, if there was one roadblock, hurdle, obstacle, issue that you see as we unwind that we really should be aware of, what might that be? And maybe we'll turn this into a positive. So what can we do? If this is an obstacle, if this is a hurdle, what, are, what, are, what is a thing or several things that we, just as regular people, can do? All of you. In any order. Uh, I'm going to stick with getting the social media stuff from the toolkit that the healthcare authority created and trying to get that pushed out through all of your networks. I think that's something easy that everyone can do. Getting the word out. Make sure that you use that social media toolkit. I would just remind, watch your mailbox. Look for the purple letter. Look for any healthcare authority letter that comes your way. Visit mysoonercare.org. Communication. Anybody else? I'd say the same thing. Awareness, um, knowing that this is going on. Talk with your friends, family, and coworkers so, and so that you know what your options are and realize that there are options so people don't feel that hopeless feeling of not being able to have access to health care, that we're here to support everyone during this process. And if you all didn't know, commercials come in three. <laughs> MyOKPlan.org certainly is a, a, a good use of everyone's time. And I'd like to just think that what we're going through this event right now is certainly worthy uh, of replication. It certainly is a grand example of what all we can do at all levels of the state of Oklahoma to help those who are less fortunate. That's absolutely right. Well, I want to say thank you. Uh, clearly, ignorance is not bliss, so we are all challenged with making sure as many people as we know, family, friends, your TikTok account, don't have one of those, uh, your Instagram account, any social media account that you have, any organization, church, your neighborhood, however you can use your own resources to get the word out, please do. I'm going to ask that Sarah and Janine come forward now because they're going to give you an official thank you for being here today and uh, excuse us when they finish. Again, Again, let me say thank you, and let's say thank you again to the, all of the panelists who've been here. Um, for our panelists, we brought you guys, we have some little treats, so take, take a flower arrangement home with you, take a Make Oklahoma Healthy for All hat with you. 
Um, and thank you guys so much for being here. We appreciate um, the capacity that we all have to collaboratively work together to prevent anyone from losing coverage who doesn't need to and to help those who do lo lose coverage to find coverage elsewhere. So. And I think one thing that is unique to Oklahoma is that we really like to work together. We like each other. We have great people in our state. And one of the things that Sarah and I would say is part of our superpower is building out a network. And we're really honored to get to build a network of amazing people that we're, I feel like I'm just kind of behind the scenes and getting to know people and connect people and trying to be that conduit to helping make a big difference. And together we can do this. And one of those people that we um, superpower text to is Trailer, and he shows up for us in all different ways at many times. And we had this award that we would like to present you for being a outstanding organization of the year and really a healthcare champion. So thank you, Trailer. <laughs> And thank you, Angela. You did a wonderful job moderating. And thank you to the, oh yeah, please, big round of applause. We, we need more Angela in our life. <laughs> And also, thank you to the Journal Record for making this possible. So much, thank you guys. And thank you to all of you here, both live and virtually. You're helping make a big difference by helping people be healthy. So thank you.